Hi, everyone. It's my honor to be here at the AAMS meeting, the virtual meeting of the AAMS 2020 meeting. Uh, I am Al Botzer, and we are going to talk a little bit about wound management. I am the pediatric dentistry head at the Tel Aviv Medical Center, and down here is my email. So let's talk about wound management following phrenotomy, or maybe is it all about tongue training? This is my hospital, the Tel Aviv Medical Center. I am located right down here. If you are in Israel, please stop by, come and visit us. So how did I get into this field? I graduated dental school at Hadassah, Jerusalem in 1990. And I spent one year at the plastic surgery department of the NYU Medical Center for cleft lip and palate patients. What I was doing there is nasal velar molding. And this is nasal, <coughs> sorry, this is nasal velar molding. We are molding the soft tissues and the hard tissues of a cleft baby to the right form. This is what I did with this kid. You see, it comes with a huge deformation and we prepare them for surgery with uh, all kinds of molding plates where we are elongating the tissues, the soft tissues and the hard tissues. So this kid underwent the, the treatment of pulling the soft tissues and it has a lot of relevance to the rest of my lecture. I came back to Israel in 96, established a pediatric dentistry clinic at the Tel Aviv Medical Center in 98, and we started research on tongue tie in the year 2000. And then, by the year 2002, my youngest daughter was born, and of course, she had a tongue tie and breastfeeding issues. That's the baby. And when she was born, we examined the rest of the kids, and that's what I saw my older child with her tongue tie but she was functioning perfectly no issues with breastfeeding speech or anything like that so you can have a tongue that looks tied but function is pretty good and this is my family as you can see my, my two daughters are here my son and my wife and this picture was taken at a very special place it is called an airport and i guess it will take us some time until we all meet in airports or even go there and we'll start with a disclosure i am the co-founder of bim medical we are the inventors of the lipo device which is a tool for tongue training and i'm going to talk about it later i treat patients with tongue tie with and without phenotomies for a fee for service in my private dentistry office and I am the salary director of pediatric dentistry at the Tel Aviv Medical Center. We also have a tongue tie research center. We started it and, and I do hope to speak in the future about our results. We are doing their phenotomies, but I have no financial gain there or to my unit. So take everything I say with a grain of salt and I hope you learn something. Let's start with the breastfeeding team. We have a newborn with breastfeeding and feeding issues. The team leader is the lactation consultant. On the team, we should have a pediatrician, a body, work, a body worker, like a physiotherapist, osteopathy, osteopath, uh, occupational therapist, craniosacral, whatever it is that are doing the body work. And the last is the surgeon. And we all must build a team that communicates regularly, regularly so uh, we get improving ourselves all the time. What are the treatment options when you see a tongue tie? So the first one is a phrenotomy, incision of the frenum. It is done by scissors, scalpel, electrocautery, lasers, and other tools. The next level is phrenectomy, where we have an excision and sometimes it involves sutures and general anesthesia. And a more invasive technique is frenuloplasty, where we are doing surgical elongation of the frenum. And this is quite rare, 
I think people sometimes are mixing between phenyloplasty and phrenectomy. Indeed, there are sutures on both cases, but phenyloplasty is a surgical procedure which is ordered in all, is aimed to elongate, to using special plastic surgery techniques to elongate it. The tools that are being used for phrenotomy are lasers, all kinds of lasers, diodes, CO2, etc. They can be used, and there can be electrocautery or quantum molecular resonance, which is a tool for brain surgery. I use a very, very special tool, which is the scissors. Now, first, we're going to talk about the four stages of wound healing. And this was taken from uh, skin articles. And I'm going to read it to you in my uh, English, Hebrew accent English. And you can mute me, look at the, at the slides, and when you review the recording, and get it without my voice. So at this, the stages of wound healing proceed in an organized way and follow the four processes. The first one is hemostasis, the second one is inflammation, proliferation, and maturation. Although the stages of wound healing are linear, wound can be progressing backwards and forward depending on the internal and external patient's condition. It is very important when we consider the treatment after uh, surgery. So as we see, there are several factors that are affecting wound healing. Some of them are stress and pain. And this is a slide that shows a lot of issues that, are, that may lead to impaired wound healing. And they are uh, having like psychological stress, etc. So make sure when we are uh, prescribing some kind of exercises following surgery, what about physical, psychological and physical stress on the patients and their families, which may lead to impaired wound healing. First phase is the hemostasis phase. And hemostasis is the process of the wound being closed by clotting. Hemostasis starts when the blood, when the blood leaks out of the body. The blood vessel constricts and to restrict the blood flow. And I use this uh, phase of constriction when I do a lip tie release, when I immediately after the release, I press on the lip to get this constriction and have minimal blood loss. And then the platelets stick together to seal the break in the wall of the blood vessel. Coagulation occurs and reinforces the platelet plug with threads of fibrin, which are like molecular binding agents. The hemostasis phase of the wound healing happens very, very quickly. The platelets adhere to the subepithelial surface within seconds of the rupture. And after that, the fibrin strands begin to adhere in about 60 seconds. As the fibrin mesh begins, the blood is transferred from, the liquid, uh, from liquid into a gel through procoagulants and the release of prothrombin. The formation of a thrombus or a clot keeps the platelet and blood cells trapped in the wound area. And this was the first stage. And here you can see a baby following phrenotomy where the blood clot dislodged from the wound site. And we see the fibrin, which you can pull it. And when you take it out, it may bleed again. No worries, time will help us stop. The second phase is the inflammatory phase, where uh, it begins right after the injury when the injured blood vessels leak tra transudate. White blood cells, growth factors, nutrients, and enzymes created, uh, create the swelling, the heat, the pain, and the redness of the wound. The inflammation both controls the bleeding and prevents infection. The fluid engorgement allows healing and repair cells to move into the sites of the wound. During the inflammatory phase, damaged cells, pathogens, and bacteria are removed from the wound area. The inflammation is a natural part of the wound healing and only problematic if it's prolonged or excessive. So once again, remember if we are instructing a patient to do exercises and reopen the wound, we may elongate the inflammatory phase. And here you can see the a patient immediately after surgery, 
And four days post-op, you can see the inflammation. It's part of the healing. There is no infection and everything is swollen and a bit of redness and the fibrin clot in the middle. Next phase is the proliferative phase. A new tissue made up of collagen and extracellular matrix is built. The wound contracts as the new tissue tissues are built. A new network of blood vessels must be constructed. Myofibroblast cause the wound to contract. In healthy stages of wound healing, granulation tissue is pink and or red or even an uneven in texture. Healthy granulation tissue does not bleed easily. Dark granulation tissue can be a sign of infection, ischemia, and poor uh, perfusion. The epithelial cells resurface the injury, and in the oral cavity, everything is moist, so it goes very, very fast. Let's talk a little bit about the collagen fibers. Collagen has several types. We'll talk about type three, which is characterized by thin fibers that present great elasticity. And the collagen type one is kept characterized by thick fibers that confer stiffness and resistance to stretch and deformation, exactly like a tendon. Okay, at the maturation phase, which is also the remodeling phase, the collagen is remodeled from type three into type one, the one which is like a tendon, and, is, and the wound is fully closed. And Unneeded cells are removed by apoptosis. When collagen is laid down during the proliferative phase, it is disorganized and the wound is thick. During the maturation phase, collagen is aligned along the tension lines and water is reabsorbed. So the collagen fibers can click together and cross-link and the cross-linking of the collagen reduces the scar thickness and also makes the skin area or the uh, mucosa uh, much stronger. Generally, remodeling begins about 21 days after injury and can continue for a year or more. Even with cross-linking, healed wound areas at the skin are weaker than the healthy skin. I don't know how it is under the tongue, but there are no major strains under the tongue, so it, I don't think it has any, any influence. This is a work by uh, Martinelli and Marquesan's group in Brazil, where they show that there are more collagen fibers of type one at the deep areas of the frenum and type three at, are more closer to the epithelium. This is a diagram that shows the healing stages, the inflammation right from the immediate moment until six days and then the proliferation and the remodeling phase. And here is another diagram shows that the hemostasis phase with the platelets immediately and then the inflammation, proliferation, remodeling, where the fibroblast, they started the inflammation phase and then they go down and the collagen fiber content is very high during the proliferative phase and then being remodeled. So keep that in mind. These are the phases that we are uh, aiming when we do the exercises. So what is the problem with wound healing after phrenotomy? About 30% of the cases undergo reattachment. And this is very, very stressing both and very depressing, both for the families, both for the dentist, the provider who doesn't want to do it again, and for the baby. So sometimes reoperation is needed. Now, here is where I first heard about tongue stretching. This was the first tongue tie summit in Orlando, where we met at one table, and we see here Betty Corillos and Roy Four from Israel, who both passed away, very sad. And during that meeting, there was a diet from Israel. Here they are, down here. The mother is a lactation consultant which has eight children. This baby right here had seven phrenotomies. The four, seven siblings were breastfed beautifully and she knows her work. They, have, they even had a phrenotomy done by Dr. Corillos, Betty Corillos right here. And when breastfeeding didn't really succeed, Jim Murphy, who stands right here, demonstrated how he's doing the stretching. 
and a miracle happened. The baby managed to breastfeed for the first time after the exercise. And then, unfortunately, it didn't last long, but this is where my eyes were opened because I was very frustrated with the percentage of reattachment. So we start to talk about aftercare. And remember, there is no scientific data to it. And there are very various names to it, like wound stretching, post-surgical physiotherapy, although the physiotherapists do not like any other person to do physiotherapy. Active wound management, a name which was, I think, invented by the group in England, and Larry Kotlow loved it. Maybe it's Larry Kotlow that started with this name. Post-surgical tank training, etc., etc. Many names for the same idea of moving and training the tank after the surgery in order to prevent reattachment. And just for you to know, there's only one reference so far about the efficacy of the post-surgical training or stretching. And this was presented at the 2013 Tank Thai Summit in Canada by the group from Montreal with Howard Mitnick, Carol Dobrich, and their peers. And what they showed is the tank stretching exercises taught immediately after phrenotomy, three times a day before feed for one to two weeks. And out of almost 400 uh, charts that they examined, they saw that there were less repeated phrenotomies than in 2012 when they compared them to 2010 when they didn't have the exercises. And what they say is the practice of stretching exercises significantly decreased the incidence of repeated phrenotomy. This is the only reference so far, and it's not a, such a good one. Everybody can agree on that. Here you can see, sorry for the blurred photo over here, but this was published in the uh, booklet of the IATP meeting in 2013. So let's talk about the aftercare. We think we want a secondary healing. This is what we think because there's no research. And the question is, should we recommend reopening the wound or just training the tongue and also the baby that the tongue can be separated from the floor of the mouth? It was never separated. Uh, what I recommend is a gentle training and lifting the tongue and slight separation of the tongue from the floor of the mouth using the finger or the LiPro device. And we'll talk about the light per device a little bit later. And there are so many active wound management or post care, surgical care protocols. For example, three to six times a day, even wake the baby at night, reopen the wound and get the fibrin out, massage the wound, lift the tongue, depress the floor of the mouth, stay in front of the baby, stay behind the baby, different protocols at different times. And I will not read it up to you, but you are more than welcome to go into those websites. This is the protocol by Kathleen Fisher from London. Uh, and this is a great protocol, a great website by Rajiv Agrawal. And you can go into his website and look for that. Everybody recommends other things. Also Bobby Geharry on his uh, blog, another uh, excellent, source for information about tongue tie and this is his protocol for uh, active wound management. So the providers recommend numerous protocols of use using the fingers, using tongue blades and I certainly do not recommend the tongue blade, using q-tips, using the LiPo device or myofunctional therapy and I do hope and we're talking about it for years that will have some myofunctional therapy protocol for newborns, neonates, or after uh, surgery. And there are some protocols for older patients. So here you can see the active wound management done with the parents or the provider's fingers. And this is a photo which I got from Jim Murphy showing an injury caused by lifting the tongue with a tongue blade and you can see the injury right here. So I definitely do not recommend that. This is a 
photo from Roy Furrer where he recommend using Q-tips and reopening the wound each and every time. One of the disadvantages of that is that you may get a hypertrophic tissue, hypertrophic tissue like this one, because the body tries to, re, to heal the, the wound and reopening, reopening it again and again may lead to a, an aggressive response of the tissue. So we just left this patient alone, didn't do anything and everything healed after three months. You can see a frenum, there is always a frenum there, always after phrenotomy. And what I recommend is using the LIPER device, which we developed it and it has several advantages, the LIPER device. First of all, it's a soft appliance, unlike the groove director, which is very, very painful when you use it under the tongue. It is very intuitive. The parents really knows easily how to use it. It is not supposed to be touching the wound. I don't want to interrupt the healing process in the wound. And like I said, it's easily accepted by the parents. It, so I get much better compliance. It's made of biocompatible materials and it's perfect texture of the surface to prevent slipping. And I must say it does not suitable for all babies. About 90, 95% of them can use it, but not all of them. And this is the LIPRO device. It has a curvature like that. It fits on the finger of various sizes of fingers. It can expand. And you can see here the texture of the surface um, is made of small bumps that cannot be, uh, that can prevent the slipping. And here is a baby immediately uh, when they are ex doing the exercise at home. My protocol to them is do it once, lift of the tongue three times a day. That was done here. And they go under the tongue, lift the tongue and that's it. Very simple, very well tolerated by the patients, by the baby. Okay, and then we came up with this understanding of non-surgical pterodoral tissue management, where we are trying to train the tongue and the orofacial muscles to improve function. And this is actually what is done by physiotherapy, osteopathy, craniosacral therapy, myofunctional therapy. Everyone is doing that. We are improving the tongue and, and, muscle, and the oral muscles to function better. And there are about 70 scientific articles on tongue training and strengthening, but none of them is on neonates and they are all at the IOP medical uh, uh, website. Another thing which is related to the osteopathy or is an old Yemenite tradition where the baby was hung by the, usually it was the grandmother, hanging it by the thumb holding the baby's the thumb is on the baby's palate and you hold him and doing some kind of a osteopathic chiropractic maneuver to improve feeding. So can we or can we not stretch the frenum? Yes, it's okay. This article by the Marcus and Group where they are showing the histologic character, characteristic of an altered human lingual frenum. They say high concentration of type 1 collagen was detected in all types of lingual frenum. Due to the fact that type 1 collagen is resistant to traction, stretching exercises may not be helpful to elongate the lingual frenum. Therefore, lingual frenotomy may be considered the appropriate procedure to release in tank the tongue in order to provide <clears throat> better oral function. On the other hand, we have the work by Nikki Mills, Nikki Mills and her team with Donna Geddes from Australia and New Zealand. And during the year of 19, 2019, they published two articles about the clinical anatomy of the frenum. And what they say is that the lingual frenum is not a discrete midline structure. It's formed by a dynamic elevation of the midline fold in the floor of the mouth of the mouth fascia. 
With this study, study the clinical concept of ankyloglossia in surgical management warrant revision. And this is their model. Instead of having the, the old model like we have of Frenum, which is a discrete structure, uh, their model shows that we have the mucosa and the fascia and the muscle, and you can have different types of frenums all have different components. And according to this uh, way of thinking, that the frenum is actually a structure made of mucosa, fascia, and sometimes muscle, it certainly can be stretched. Remember this, where we do tissue, soft tissue elongation, and this is where we came up with the liper and the training of the tongue to do the non-surgical feathered oral tissue management. We give them home exercises to lift and train the tongue for better function, both for neonates and older patients, training the muscles and also training the brain that never had this uh, maneuver done. And at the same time, we are stretching and maybe elongating the oral mucosa and the oral fascia. And these are exercises done on babies who did not require surgery, although they had issues with movement. So you can see they hold the, the liper device and they go under the tongue and they are doing the exercises about five to six times, five repetitions, five to six times a day. This one was here and here is another one. And here she holds the, the device going downwards. So you can use it both ways, either going downwards, usually on a more retrognatic patient, or holding it turned up upwards, like here. And it can be very easily used by parents. So this is my ideal protocol on a newborn. Pre-surgical training, because it has several benefits, you do it for a couple of days before the surgery, you do it five times a day, it helps you train the tongue and the brain that the tongue can be lifted, perhaps strengthen and stretch the structures that we may get a better range of movement and maybe even we don't have the surgery redundant. And then the parents are getting used to doing the exercises in a less stressing condition. There is no wound, the baby is more relaxed. And after surgery, they can do it when they are more confident. Immediately after surgery, we uh, instruct them to lift the tongue with the liper device three times a day for two weeks. And not to do it too vigorously because uh, it may scar more. This is my opinion. And there will always be a frenum after healing. This is how it's held. So we had an internal survey a few years ago. We still don't have any research about it. And I do hope now with the center, the research center at our hospital, or if any of you wants to be involved in a, a research about the LIPER use, please contact me and we'll get you the devices following your protocol. So we did a survey about 41 patients, newborns, and 92% of the parents reported a significant improvement. 30, 75% reported that the device was easy to use. 73% of the parents reported the device is more efficient than using the fingers. 
50% uh, of the borderline cases, those that we were not sure about whether they need surgery or not, improved and actually did not need any surgery after the training. And parents that used the fingers stretching but had reattachment preferred the lighter device much more than the finger when we did the surgery again. Now let's talk a little bit about tongue training for older patients. As we talked before about the breastfeeding team over here, now when we are dealing with older patients, toddlers and children and adolescents and adults, we have a different team, which is kind of the same. We have the speech pathologist or the myofunctional therapist as the team leader, and we have the ENT, the orthodontist, the dentist, or even the sleep medicine uh, doctor there. And the team consists, of course, of a body worker, again, physiotherapy, occupational therapist, osteopath, craniosacral, and the surgeon is the last one. And each and every one of those team members should be aware of the tongue training. Actually, most of them, this is what they are doing. And I love this infographic uh, slide by Sarus Zaghi and his group, where they are talking about the effect of ankyloglossia. And they put a lot of uh, uh, weight on the need of pre-surgical treatment and also the post-surgical treatment. And this is how kids and adults are using the, the LiPro device. Here he is three years old and he's using it by himself before getting trained and immediately following the surgery, he will be able to do the exercises too, even though it hurts. And my protocol for older patients is uh, tongue training for at least six weeks prior to surgery and they do it five times a day. Among other, among other exercises that are given to them, by the myofunctional therapist or the, or the speed pathologist, like uh, tongue movement and, and the cave and, and whatever. And then two months post-op, also five times a day with the other exercises. And the training is done under the speech pathologist or the myofunctional therapist monitoring. And from my experience, many of the toddlers that even didn't know how to lift the tongue before when they got to me, once they started doing the training and they did proper training, getting ready for surgery, they had full improvement and they had no need for surgery. So let me say that we need much more research and thank you very much. And please let's hope to meet in person on much more normal life. Thank you and bye-bye.